Well, we've been looking at the I am's of Jesus, some of the famous ones and some of the slightly less famous ones in, in John. And uh, today I'm, probably, I'm going to look at probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible, if not the famous, but certainly very well known by people, even if they've never been in church. They probably have heard it somewhere along the line. Uh, the, the verses that talk about being the good shepherd and about being the gate. Now the thing about this is when you look at this, you go, oh, I know this story. I know it really well. I've heard it all before. And it's like, I know what he's going to say. He's going to say this bit. He's going to say this bit. And, and we can find ourselves sometimes with very famous Bible verses or Bible stories. We can find ourselves coming a bit to them and actually almost riding over them and missing actually important things. Sometimes we might say, oh, there's nothing new to learn. Is that true? Is that true? At the very least, there are things to be reminded of. But I believe, actually, in, in my many years of reading the Bible, actually, things that I've read hundreds of times before, suddenly, something jumps out. And I think, how have I never seen that before? And I've had one of those today, which I'll mention to you in a little bit, see if you've got it. But for me, there was one I went, goodness me, I must have seen that so many times, and yet I felt. So um, there's always something new the Holy Spirit wants to show us. Areas of truth, words, phrases to be highlighted. So what I thought we'd do is a little exercise, and you can do it if you're here with family, uh, you can do it together, but... Um, I've done, done it in double spacing on purpose. It's also from the New Living Translation. And one of the reasons for this is that sometimes when you've got a version a bit like mine that you may have read a lot, so much so it's got gaffer tape is holding it together, it becomes very familiar. And actually sometimes to read something that's slightly less familiar, that can also catch your attention. Um, there are translations that we very much believe in, the, the ESV, the English Standard Version, the NIV and so on. But there's many, many other translations. So this is the New Living. So what I thought we'd do, everyone's got a pencil or a pen. You can use your own Bible if you want. I am a marker of Bibles, so I don't know if I open, but they literally open it and my Bible is marked. Some people don't. My, my dad died last year, and I was very excited, being the eldest son and being the preacher. I got given my dad's Bible, and I was very excited because I wanted to see it, and I wanted to see all his notes and underline and things. He comes from good brethren background. Not a single note in his Bible. <laughs> Nothing at all. I was like, oh, rats. <laughs> I wanted to see, but... Uh, yeah, he was a hero. My dad was a hero from that. He, he, he led us as a family through many challenging days. Anyway, keep, keep going, Mark. <laughs> um, what I'd like you to do is, as we read this, I'm going to read it slowly to you. And you can underline, you can circle, you can highlight. What jumps out at you? What, what makes you go, oh, not seen that before? You can put a question mark. What does that mean? Don't understand that bit. Um, put a question mark beside it. Um, whatever sort of way, uh, maybe you think, I need to go and explore that some more. Whatever it might be, or it's just something that you just love, you want to underline it, circle it. You might do some arrows. Do you know what? That bit connects to that bit. Okay? So feel free to scribble, doodle. Um, I don't mind. Hannah doodles everything all the time, so that's fine. Um, Okay, are you ready? So before we do, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we believe your word is living and active. It's not dead. Your word is living and active. In fact, the Bible describes itself like a sword that cuts right the way through the rubbish to the very heart of things. Right through to the, to the soul. Right through to the very heart. And Lord, as we read some very familiar verses, would you come and speak by your Holy Spirit, the one who reveals Jesus, the one who is the Spirit of truth. We thank you for your words. We pray as we read it together, you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 10 and verse 1. I tell you the truth. 
Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. Sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. They follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely. and will find good pasture. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees the wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him. He isn't their shepherd. So the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's only working for money. Doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I've other sheep too. They're not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, now we'll do the brave bit I didn't warn you of. Maybe turn to somebody you know, and if you don't know somebody next to you, just chat for a minute or three about what you've underlined, why you've underlined it, or questions that you have. If there is a visitor nearby you, you won't know they're a visitor, so say hello and say, are you a visitor? Okay? Um, but uh, just, just find somebody, just have a little chat together. Um, Anything surprise you? What stood out to you? What reminded you of something? What questions? Just have a little chat, okay? We'll have a little bit of a buzz. There's still water at the back if you need it. <clears throat> One of the things, when you take any Bible verse, you're taking any verses, but particularly perhaps stories that are really famous, you can miss things. You need to think about the context. Mick talked about that last week, didn't he? And the, the context of all of of this story about the sheep starts a whole chapter before. We know the chapters weren't there originally, but it helps us. And chapter 9 uh, is, the, is the context. Um, so 
when you've got questions and you say, well, what is this all about? What's going on? You need to look at the verses above and the verses after, sometimes the chapters before and the chapters after, sometimes the whole book. And particularly with John, John is going somewhere. He's telling a story. Um, and so actually all the I am's of Jesus right the way through John are all linked together. And they're there for a reason. So the context, he's talking to the Pharisees, these religious leaders, the Jewish leaders. And the context is the man who'd been healed at the temple. And this man had been healed, amazing miracle by Jesus. He'd been born blind. And what the problem was they discovered that Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath. Uh-oh. Okay. He'd made some mud uh, and he'd put it on the man's eyes. That's work, making mud. Um, and, and praying for someone, that's work. He was working on the Sabbath. Um, it was against the, the religious rules. Um, and because of that, they, they were cross. But they couldn't find Jesus, so they picked on the man. They picked on the man to ask him, what was this all about? And the man actually was like, why do you keep asking me? Go and ask Jesus. You know, One thing I know, famous verse, one thing I know, I was blind, now I can see. All right. <laughs> it's like, don't pick on me. And they, but the thing is, they didn't like him being cross like that. They didn't like him. And so they threw him out of church, basically. They excommunicated him. Jesus heard that they'd thrown him out and they went to find him. Um, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. Can you hear a link? If you were here two or three weeks ago when Hannah spoke to us about the woman at the well, the woman's talking, Jesus is having a whole conversation. She doesn't know who she's talking to. And eventually she says, Oh, well, I know one day the Messiah's coming. And he goes, Hello. Hello, I am he who speaks to you. It's me here. What? And again, with this man, do you know who I am? No. Tell me that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you've seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. There's a good response there, isn't there? Jesus goes on, he said, for judgment, I've come into this world. This is the context. You think, well, Mark, where are you going? I want to give you a picture. All right? I have come so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. The thing about the whole of John's book is you've got these Pharisees, these religious leaders who think they're sorted. They think they've got it all together and they really, really do not like Jesus and, and what he's about, what he stands for. And basically, Jesus is telling all sorts of stories and doing all sorts of things to point out to them how blind they are, how deaf they are, how resistant they are to the true gospel. The kingdom of God is right there amongst them and they're missing it. But for anyone who's got eyes to see, anyone who's got a heart to receive, then they're welcomed into the kingdom. But the Pharisees are blind spiritually. They, they, they can't see what's going on. Um, and so he said, I've come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were there heard him say this and said, what, are we blind too? So they got an idea he's, he's having a go. <laughs> Jesus said, if you were blind, you'd not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim to see, your guilt remains. And he's challenging them. He talks quite a lot like this. He talks in what we might refer to in our language as riddles. The Bible uses the word parables. He would tell them a story. The story of the good shepherd is not really a parable, but, it, but it is, it's, a, it's a picture with meaning. Um, and Jesus does it a lot. Things are a bit hidden, but for those who've got eyes to see and ears to hear... They're going to grasp something. There's special things that he wants to say. So those who listen carefully, those who've got soft hearts, who are open to God, they hear and understand. But many, especially the Pharisees, had hard hearts. Spiritually, their ears were deaf. They felt like they had the truth and they were deaf. They weren't listening. Blind eyes. They couldn't understand what he was saying. 
And in some versions, when he tells the story again for the second time, he, it says, he told them even more plainly. But they still didn't get it. And this brings us to chapter 10. It's slightly complicated because he starts off talking, as, as Joyce so wonderfully unpacked, about being the true shepherd who enters through the gate. Um, but, but then he talks about being the gate himself. Um, what he's saying is, in the first couple of verses that you read there, he's the Messiah, he's the true shepherd. And he's, but what he's saying is, I've come the right way. If you go back into all of your scriptures and you look at your scriptures and follow it along, you will see me. I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. I'm there, I'm there with David, I'm there. I've come the right way. I've come the right way, but you're missing it. You're missing it. So in these first verses, he's saying, I've come the right way. I'm the true shepherd, the good shepherd. And then he uses the gate that basically others were pretending. They're false, and at best they're leading the nation astray. At worst, they are destructive thieves. They've got no real care for the flock. So you've got religious leaders who are saying we're very religious, but they're not looking after the flock. They're just putting these laws and heavy weights on people, <clears throat> pretending that they care, but they don't really. But they don't understand what he's saying. Anyway, there's lots we could do, but I did this same exercise. And what I thought I'd do just for a couple of minutes is, is pull out a couple of things that jumped out at me, and they may have jumped out at you as well. But I did the same exercise. So John 10 I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. I mean, like Mike, I almost underlined every single bit and circled everything. But then I went back and I thought, what really jumps out at me? What really stands out at me? And this is a famous bit, I guess. Um, but this was the first bit. Verse 3, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep recognize his voice and comes to him. He calls his own sheep by name. By name. That was the thing that I particularly highlighted. Who else highlighted that? By name. By name. The personal nature of the relationship of the shepherd with the sheep. He knows you by name. Do you believe that? Do you know that? Do you hear that? He knows, we, yes, we're part of the family of God. Yes, those of us who are here at Apex, those of you in the home church that you come from, we're part of uh, as the family of God in the UK. We're part of a worldwide, but we're not part of an amorphous lump. Somehow we're just all lumped together. Each one of us is individual, and he knows you by name. He knows your markings. He knows uh, your personality. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses, your concerns, your joys. He knows you. He calls you by name. That's the other thing, is that he calls you by name. Now, we need to attune our ears to hear his call. But he calls you by name. He speaks to you by name. So that was something that... Just for me, you highlight. and you, It's a bit like a marble in a, in a tin. If you put a marble in a tin and you can roll it around, roll it backwards and forwards, and sometimes I'll do that, take a verse like that and you roll it around. Maybe you're going for a walk. He knows me by name. What does that mean? When did I last hear God calling my name? How does God speak my name? What does God sound like? I'm throwing out lots of questions today. You can write some of them down and you can think of them. This was another bit. After he's gathered his flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. They recognize that voice. This was a little bit, uh, two bits that stood, stood out to me. They know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Now, I'm sure one or two of you will have underlined, they know his voice. Who underlined that? Yeah. Who underlined they will run from him? Did anybody underline or circle? That's a, uh, yeah. That's a, uh, verse 5. See, know his voice. The implication, we know that. How do you know someone's voice? Because you spent time with them, yes? 
How does a, I, I heard an article this week on the news somewhere. They were saying that they think babies actually begin to learn the language in the womb. Because uh, it was amazing. I can't remember the different nations they were talking about. But, you know, some languages, the intonation at the end of a sentence will go up. And some, the intonation goes down. How, how you would finish a word or a sentence. And they've done this whole survey and discovered that babies from different nations, very early on, the sounds they're making either go up or they go down based on words that they've heard in the womb. Language they've heard in the womb. It's amazing. So how... How do we know his voice? We spend time living in a day and a time, you see, where there's so many voices being bombarded and with social media even more. Loads and loads. And there's people's voices and then they retweet or repost other people's voices. So you've got their voice and you've got them telling you what someone else is saying and they usually either like it or they don't like it. But there's all these voices How do we know and recognize the voice of the Lord in the midst of all these voices? My sheep know my voice. Spent many hours with the shepherd. Chatting with my middle daughter, we're we're on stage two of of three stages of family visits. Um, we've uh, We've had one eldest daughter eldest grandson we've now got middle daughter and two middle grandchildren and then next week we've got youngest daughter and bump um, who's uh, I'm now officially allowed to announce that I'm about to become a fourth time grandfather so um, (laughs) um, but I was talking to my middle daughter this morning because she's taken herself off of Instagram she's of the generation she really, she follows some great people actually, really informative. She's a young mum and she was saying about some great mums out there with great information. And I said to her this morning over breakfast, I said, because I was aware of this, I said, why have you taken yourself off of Instagram? And she said, the thing is, she said, I found every moment, I just pick it up and I wanted to see what people are saying. But she said, I just flick and flick and scroll and scroll and scroll. And uh, she said, uh, when Callum was away with me in Burundi, she said, I, I suddenly realized, she said, I hadn't really done this, I hadn't tidied up. She said, I hadn't drunk any water. She said, I hadn't done this, that, and the other. She said, I was quite lonely, feeling isolated. Callum was with me in Burundi. And, uh, and she said, I just was trying to get it from Instagram. But she said, I wasn't getting it. It was making me feel worse. I was feeling quite more and more isolated. And so there's a couple of people particularly that are very informative and helpful. So she will go and see them in another way. But she's taken herself. And this brings me to the second part. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. What does that mean in our day and time? Running from voices. Running from certain voices. I think for some of us it means turning off Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, or TikTok, or, you know, go on, you can keep listing them. How do we run from voices that are strangers, voices that are not helpful, voices that will lead us astray? What does it mean? Sometimes you have to look at a voice, it's it, you have to look at a verse and say, what does that actually mean? What am I practically going to do about that? Certain television programs or certain things on whatever station you like to mention. Running means turning off, turning over, turning away. That's what running, running from them means. It's a conscious, deliberate delete. Turn off, turn over. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying these things are wrong. I'm not saying we all have to go home and delete all of them. What I'm saying is, what voices are we listening to? And do we run from the voices that are strangers? What does that mean? Do we run? So that was something that really jumped out for me. Now here's something that caught me. Here's verse 6. So this is in the New Living. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained to them, I tell you the truth, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. The true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Here's a famous verse. I am the gate. Those who come through me will be saved. However, When I read this for the first time, I read it in the message version. 
Has anybody ever heard of the message? You know, I love the message at times. It's great. It's a great, it, because it puts things very differently. The only thing is, you have to be aware with some of these translations, they put it so differently that, that it loses the meaning of what was actually supposed, we were supposed to know and understand. All right? So you need to be aware. And the message version would be one of those. So I was reading this in the message version, and I got to this verse, and it says, I am the gate. Anyone who goes through me will be cared for. And I went, hang on a minute. Now, because I've read the Bible, thank, you'll be pleased to hear quite a few times, and particularly John 10, because it's one of my favorite, I've read it many, many times. I thought it doesn't say that in my Bible, which is a conversation I once had with the Jehovah's Witnesses. They quoted the Bible to me. I said, it doesn't say that in my Bible. Rushed off and got my trusty NIV, looked it up, and it did say that in my Bible. <laughs> and then I, then I had to really think about what it, how they were applying it. Anyway, that's another story for another time. Um, <laughs> so I went, I went straight away to the NIV and I got the ESV lying along beside it and of course you can do that on your computer as well and of course the word there is saved now if you look in the little margins and the little comments and maybe if you've got one or two of you might have your Bibles open there's a little note there and it does actually say in some of the, um, the margins kept safe or will find safety. But the translators, the best ones, the good ones, have gone to it and understood that the word, yes, is about being kept safe and safety, but actually it's about being saved. There's a salvation element to this safety. It isn't just about having a nice bloke looking after you. There's something more Okay, because I stopped and I had to go back. It didn't ring right in my ears. And that's one of the things I'm trying to say to you is that when you're hearing something, you're talking to a friend, a neighbor, a colleague, there are moments, if we know the voice of the Lord, if we have soaked ourselves in the word of God, there are moments where we'll go, hold on a minute, that doesn't ring right. I'm not, sometimes I'm not quite sure why I need to go back to the Bible. But you see, if we... If my head is always in Twitter and what they're saying in Twitter, I lo I'm a big follower of the news, so I follow lots of news. And uh, I follow Mike Cox, and he tweets lots of things. Anyway, um, <laughs> but most of which I ignore. So <laughs> um, but if I'm in that all of the time, how do I? And when somebody says something, and I go, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, sounds about right. Hold on a minute, just a minute. No, that doesn't sound right. Is that, is that what my good old faithful NIV or ESV says? No, it says saved. Saved. And then you begin to see the little footnotes. So it's a bit more. It's not just about physical safety and a bit of green grass. There's a deeper meaning to this word save, which is, which is better. It has the sense of being delivered safe and sound. Okay, hang on a minute. Like a person who's recovering from a severe illness or has come through bad storm or survived a war. Do you remember how Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Lead us not into temptation, but, but deliver us. Deliver us. Hang on. Connections in the Bible being made. Deliver us. Lead us. There's a leading. There's a safety. There's a, there's a caring. But it's not just a there, there, here's a bit of grass. Deliver us from the evil one. Hallelujah. When you go to the one who is the door, the gate, you are saved. You are literally delivered from the evil one. Whether that be false prophets Religious leaders who want to bind you up in legalistic traditions or even the evil one himself. There's a salvation. There's a saving. And with that comes life. Life. Abundant life. I come from an authorized background in my childhood. In fact, I, I actually grew up with J.N.D. Uh, J. Darby's Bible. But that's another story because I come from the brethren. But... 
abundant life is how the old authorized John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life. And in the good old ver- older versions, abundant life. Life abundantly. So what I just did was I looked at a, a couple. In this instance, I looked at a couple of different versions. I love this New Living Translation. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Do you hear that today? That's the promise of the Lord for you. A rich and satisfying life as we look to him and follow him. Here is the message which I loved. I came so that they can have real and eternal life. So there's some real clarity there. It's not just life today. Real and eternal life. More and better life than they ever dreamed of. Wonderful to hear what um, Lucy is sharing there. And if you get a chance, ask Lucy about a story, about a massive story, far away from God as you could possibly be, broken and lost. And yet, she's come to know rich and satisfying life, um, uh, abundant life, more than she could ever have dreamed of. That's, you just thank you for your testimony. That's the hope and the heart of the gospel. And we can miss some of these things as we read verses that are so famous. So famous to us. And of course, here's the heart of the gospel. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Now, I'm just coming into land. For those who are getting really hot, I'm definitely getting really hot because I'm very animated up here. But here was something that stood out to me that I had never spotted before. I've read it before, but just listen to this. Verse 14. I'm the good shepherd... I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. Did anybody highlight that in verse 14? Did anybody in 15? Mike's got it. That's because you highlighted and underlined the whole scripture, is it? No, no, no. No. You You notice that. Listen to it again. I know my sheep. And they know me just as my Father knows me and I know the Father. Think about the implication of that just for a moment. It's profound. Jesus knows you and wants to know you at the same level and the same depth as the Father knows the Son and the Son knows the Father. It's not about a little shallow conversation once a week when I get a moment. I know my sheep and they know me just as my Father knows me and I know the Father. The depth of relationship that we are called to that we're invited into. This is nothing remote. This is nothing distant or detached. This is incredible relational walk with our Creator, our Maker, our Sustainer. You can meditate on that for the next week. Just as my Father, in the same way, my Father knows me and I know the Father. That's the invitation for each one of us. Isn't that amazing? It's astonishing. There's lots and lots in these three verses, 14, 15, 16. We could could spend a long time. I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too. We've mentioned that. They're not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. I mean, there's lots and lots of material there just in those three verses. I know my sheep and they know me. I've just mentioned that as the father knows the the son and the son knows the father. Let's just highlight the most famous of it all. I am the good shepherd. One of the most famous phrases in the Bible. I love this quote from a commentary writer who's written a series of commentaries on all the books of the Bible, a man called Phil Moore. He says this, Our assurance of our salvation stems from the goodness of our shepherd, not from our goodness as sheep. I, for one, want to say, Phew, thank goodness for that. 
Can I read it to you again? Our assurance of salvation that we have been saved stems not uh, stems from the goodness of our shepherd, not from our goodness as sheep. It's not about my behaviour first and foremost. Will I get saved because of how I'm living today? No, it's about how he died on the cross and how he rose again. That's the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep, who sacrifices his life for the sheep. He's not just a nice, friendly chap who goes, here's some green grass. He's our saviour, our deliverer, our mighty defender, our stronghold. I could really get going now, but it's getting hot. It's by grace, Ephesians 2, you've been saved through faith, through putting your faith. It's not from yourself, it's a gift of God. Not by work so that no one can boast. He's called us to live a holy life. He's called us to a life of obedience. Yes, he has, but that doesn't save us. The good shepherd sacrificed his life. If my sacrifice is based, if, sorry, if my salvation is based on my goodness, then some days I may feel like I'm doing okay. Other days I definitely feel like I'm not. It's not based on my goodness. It's based on His. The glorious perfection. He's not a nice shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It also takes us into the realm of the sovereignty of God and our free will. I know my sheep. I have other sheep too. They're not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. God is at work. He's bringing. He's saving. Uh, we haven't got time to go into a very big subject, but uh, it stood out so strongly to me that bit. Bring them also. These other sheep are you. You see, sometimes, again, in our day and our culture and our time, people might say, but I, follow, I chose to follow Jesus. I made the decision to follow him. And there's a sense in which that is true. However, Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent them draws them. And I will raise them up on the last day. And he repeats it again in verse 65. So Phil Moore says again, we only have any sense of choosing God because he first chose us. And because of that, we can trust him to protect us. We can trust him to enable us to persevere in that choice. He chose me. I decided to follow him. And daily, I'm deciding to follow him. I will keep following. I'll listen to his voice. Why? Because he's the good shepherd. Because he called me out. And I will follow him. And I'll keep following him. So, he chose you. He knows you by name. He will protect you. He will fill you. He will guide you. He will carry you through right to the end. And he will raise you up on the last day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your charge is to listen to him, to follow him, to run away from strangers. The non-God-honoring, corrupting, robbing voices. There's a clear message that comes right through John's Gospel that we need to search and check our hearts that we are not like the Pharisees. Somehow we think we've got it sorted. Resisting God's shepherd. Seeking other gateways to salvation. He wants us to be sure that we are not blind or deaf to who Jesus really is. Can I invite you to stand? Thank you for staying with me in this heat. Let's just take just a second to respond in this moment. I could have read further on. Just listen again. There's more and more in these verses. Verse 27. Just listen as part of our response. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. 
So for each one of us today, there's an invitation again to come to the Good Shepherd. Maybe you say, I've been a long way off. I'm, I'm just watching on from a distance. He wants you to know safety and security. But it's not just a nice feeling, it's salvation. New life, forgiveness of sins, new life in Christ, eternal hope. My sheep, listen to my voice. There's an invitation this morning to listen again to Jesus, to come close. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. I want to pray, Lord, this morning that there will be assurance here in this room, assurance of eternal life, that as we listen to you, as we follow you, you lead us right into eternity. As Hannah said earlier, Lord, it starts now and leads us right on into eternity. No one will snatch them out of my hand. We thank you, Lord, for our security in Christ. As we listen to you, as we follow you, we thank you for your protection. We thank you for the assurance. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I'm the good shepherd. I am the gate. Lord, just pray. One or two maybe individuals here, you'd say, I know about this stuff, I've heard it. Not sure what it means to me real personally. I believe that God is saying to you today, I know your name. I know your name. I've called you by name. Won't you come and follow? Won't you submit your life to me? I want to lead you into abundant life. I want to lead you into a glorious, eternal hope. I want to feed you spiritually and build you and strengthen you, encourage you. I invite you today to respond. I pray that there would be one or two, at least here this morning, who for the first time would say, Yes, Lord. I will follow you. Yes, Lord, make me one of your sheep. I don't want to listen to those other voices. Help me to run away from some of those voices I've been listening to. Help me to begin to hear your voice, to tune in to your voice. I ask your forgiveness for my rebellion. I followed other voices. I reject those voices today and I come to your voice. I look to your face. Lead me, guide me. Lord, I pray where there's a battle in our lives, strengthen us. Holy Spirit, enable us and empower us. Lord, where we're tempted to keep listening to other voices, help us to switch off, switch over, turn off, get rid of, run away from. Give us strength by your Holy Spirit. Give us enabling power to stay close to you and to run from those other voices. So Lord, we, we just give you our lives and we give you these days. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.